Hey everyone, welcome to Open Source Friday where we chat with an open source maintainer about their project and how you can contribute. Uh, today I'm joined by two awesome guests. I have Simon with me, who's the maintainer of Zap, and I have Joseph with me, who is a GitHub security um, developer advocate. Um, I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and if it's okay, I'll start with Joseph. My name is Joseph. I work for the GitHub Security Lab, and our mission is to inspire the community to secure the open source software that we all depend on. And I'm excited to have with us uh, Simon today. Simon. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. My name's Simon Bennett. Uh, I released SAP in 2010, and I'm one of the core team. Uh, I've got a core team who maintain it now. Uh, uh, so that's what I do, but I uh, actually work full time for JIT, um, who are bringing together a whole load of open source security tools and um, building a platform on top of that. Um, but they let me work on Zap full time. That's awesome that they let you work on Zap full time. Um, I love to see more companies embracing open source and letting their, their developers and employees get to invest in other things. All right, um, why don't we just like, ask the question of like, what is Zap for people who are wondering? Sure, so Zap is a tool for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. And it's, it's a bit different from if you're aware of network scanners, which kind of look for known vulnerabilities, a case where, you know, the traditional, we know you're running, say a WordPress site and you've got this WordPress plugin, therefore we know it's vulnerable to this uh, particular vulnerability. Zap's different, it looks for new and interesting vulnerabilities. It looks for custom vulnerabilities. So it can be an app that no one's seen before, but Zap will still attack it. Uh, it's what's called a dynamic application security uh, product. And it means it is um, tool, and it means it attacks an application in a similar way to a malicious attacker. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I also see that, just want to give a call out to the viewers. I see that we have 12 people watching as soon as we started. Feel free to like chat with us, tell us where you're calling in from, and feel free to ask questions as we go. Because um, we definitely want to interact with, with the audience and we don't want to just be talking to ourselves. All right. Um, I wanted to, I don't know if it's too early, but... Uh, we usually start off with a little bit of a demo, and then we go into asking you a few more questions. So are you ready for, for the demo? <laughs> yeah, let's just share my screen then. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> oh, hey, Bakari. Um, he just said that he's here. Thanks for, for tuning in. Okay. Let's do this. Hopefully you can see Zap now. Yes, I can. Looking good. Great. Um, so Zap, I mean... It starts off as a desktop tool, so it's got this desktop interface. Um, but actually, most people use it in an automated way, completely automated. Um, but obviously, that's hard to demo, so I'll just show you the desktop to start with. And it might look like there's a lot going on, but there's actually loads more. SAP is a tool with lots of depth. Uh, we try and make it easy to have some kind of simple things. We've got an automated scan, but what I'll do is I'll do a manual explore. Um, what you can do here is you can actually choose to um, basically say what your, your target application in is, and then you can launch a browser to explore it. So uh, this is a, a very, very venerable, um, deliberately vulnerable application I created years ago. Uh, and what you can do is you can just kind of explore it and you know, just, just do, do, do the normal testing on it. So if you're kind of just testing it as a developer or a QA person. And what happens is, because, oh, and you can tell this is a demo because that didn't work right. Let me just try Chrome. All good with me. The demo gods are never with me. The demo gods are not happy, are they? Um, <laughs> this is typical. There it is. Yeah, but it is not happy because oh. it is not proxying things, which is the whole point. Let me just, I know, I'm going to stop sharing. And very quickly, um, I'm going to relaunch this because that will definitely help. Okay. Uh, and well, in the meantime, you can uh, ask me questions because uh, I will yeah. just. I'll let, I'll let Joseph go ahead and ask some of the questions then, if you're able to multitask. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think one time at Java One, I, when I was giving my demo, I, I started off the, the talk and immediately my, my Windows laptop blue streamed. Um, so that's, I'm used to kind of the demo gods, you know, it's, these things happen. Wait, actually, I see a question yeah, in exactly. the chat. <laughs> You've seen it too? Okay, cool. I wanted to highlight this. Um, I am Rita Areta. So what makes that better than Burp from your point of view? Uh, well, I mean, from my point of view, there's some, you know, one, Burp is a great tool, so I'm not going to diss it. Um, <laughs> but you've also got to be aware that things are a little bit different. So Burp is a commercial tool, and it's maintained by a company uh, with 30 plus full-time employees. Um, Zap is different because it, it is completely free and open source. So, uh, you know, if you're not interested in that, then, you know, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, but I think it's very important to have a tool like Zap that is actually um, completely free and anyone can, you know, and anyone can contribute to. So Zap is very much a community project. I started it because I wanted to learn about security. And um, I was a developer, that's my background. I wanted to learn about security. I wanted to join a, uh, a community-based security tool, a project, and it didn't exist. There was nothing like this around. So I started SAP as a way to learn about security and to create the community I was looking for. So wow. if you want to get involved in security, you can contribute to SAP. You, you know, we've had loads of students, we've had security people, we've had developers. It's a way of learning. Uh, and so, you know, if you're a security professional, I would expect you to have a Burp Pro license, but you should know the best tools out there and Zap is really good for certain things. So you should know Burp, um, Burp and Zap. And I'd say Zap is better than Burp in some things like automation. It's one of our strengths. Scripting uh, is another one. Um, we have insane scripting support. You can script pretty much anything you like. Uh, and, you know, one of the things is because Zap is open source, you know, source code available, but also the data belongs to you. So we make everything available. So you can write scripts which basically change how Zap works on the fly. And you've access to all the internals. You can call any of the Zap functions. Everything's available to you. So Zap is way more customizable. Um, and the automation, I mean, Zap is, is the world's most popular web application scanner, um, partly because it's free, but also because it's so good at automating. That's awesome. Go ahead, Joseph. Sorry. Simon, in the beginning of the, um, of the show, you talked, uh, you explained that Zap is a dynamic analysis tool. Um, I've seen some developers in the past asking me what is more important for their web application, static analysis, dynamic analysis. What's your answer to those developers? I think that's actually a really good question. And I think the important thing is that there used to be this kind of static versus an out, um, dynamic argument, and it's completely wrong. Uh, there is, they are different ways of approaching the same thing. So if you want to completely understand a running application, you need to have static analysis because that analyzes source code. You need dynamic analysis because it attacks the application the way an attacker would. You need source code analysis to work out what your dependencies are. You need to understand the configuration. Um, so, you know, all the cloud stuff as well, you know, how it's deployed. So there's loads of things you have to understand and no one tool will tell you that. So, so um, if, you, if you start a brand new project, uh, you get static analysis in straight away because that will tell you, as soon as you start writing code, it'll point things out and you can fix them. If you've got a big existing project and you throw static analysis in, you'll get tons of um, alerts coming up and you go, well, what do I do? You know, we added a static analysis to Zap years ago. Um, we had so many issues and very few of them were actually serious, but it was overwhelming. But, you know, a lot of us work in security. Obviously we work in security, we understand these things and we worked our way through them. And now, you know, we've, all of our PRs get static analysis run on them. Uh, if there are any problems, we fix them there. And we're going through fixing some of the older things, which are less mm -hmm. important. Um, so the new project gets static analysis straight away. If you've got no security on an existing product, uh, dynamic analysis. That is your, that's what the attacker sees. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that is what people will be doing right now. The attackers mm -hmm. will be attacking our applications using the same techniques as your best tools like Zap. So that's really important. But things like, you know, your, um, software composition analysis is key as well because mm -hmm. you've got to keep your dependencies up to date. Um, so you need all of these things. You shouldn't be going, I will only do one of these types of tools 
But if you're getting started, you need to start somewhere. So new project, I'd say SAST first. Then when you've got something running, you, get, you bring in DAST, get SCA in to start with as well. Um, existing product, start with DAST. You know, start uh -huh. with DAST, bring SCA and bring SAST in, but expect to find loads of, uh, loads of things that are reported to you. I also found really interesting the fact, the fact that you mentioned that when you started Zap, what made you start in the beginning was the fact that there was no other community out there for you to join and do this open source security tool. Uh, but you didn't mention when, how far ago was that and how things have changed over the years. What's the state of today? So that was in 2010. Um, I actually started, so I forked a, 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 an abandoned secu a security project called Paris Proxy. Uh, and I got involved because in 2009, I developed a web application that was um, pen tested and found loads of vulnerabilities, which I'd never heard of. And, it, you know, I was a developer, but I've had no security training, um, zero. So it's not surprising a lot of vulnerabilities. So I wanted to learn about things I learned best by doing. So I wasn't planning on moving into security. I just wanted to make my own applications more secure. So I thought I'd find an open source security project. I will run it against my applications every night so I don't get embarrassed by the pen testers. But I'd use it as a way of learning about security. And I thought, you know, I want to get involved in open source. This could be a good way in. I wasn't planning on starting an open source project and certainly not one which turned into the, the monster it has. But you're saying how things have changed. And I think things have changed significantly. Um, so in general, I think they're better, to be honest. Um, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. Um, and I think there's a whole range of reasons. One is um, better education. So developers know more about security these days. They've had some training often. And organizations like OWASP have really helped. Mm -hmm. um, I think better frameworks. So things like your React, your Angular, your views, they're more secure out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, they're escaping things. They're not allowing to the, um, you know, the same kind of um, vulnerable um, things that people did in the past. That, you know, mm -hmm. They're escaping properly, which is key. And the split between your front end and having a back end access via an API, it means you think about these things a bit more. Um, so there's not that blurring. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that generally helps. Um, definitely better open source, open source security tools like Zap, um, but also there's a whole load of, particularly the SaaS tools, um, commercial tools that are free to open source developers, um, which we use in Zap as well. So the availability of these tools um, really helps. Um, and running security tests in CI CD. So I'm a big fan of GitHub Actions. Um, we've got Zap GitHub Actions. Um, all the Zap um, PRs get you know SaaS um, scanning as part of um, the pull requests. Um, this is really important, you know, making it easier to make sure you're secure as you're developing the code. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think, um, bad publicity. All the news stories about um, um, corporations getting hacked, you know, turning up on national TV, that actually helps security um, awareness and means, um, you know, people are developers aware of it. And I will just, so Lissy wants to join in. She likes um, helping out. <laughs> And yeah. she will <laughs> try and walk on my keyboard. And so if things go horribly wrong, it's definitely her fault. That's OK. I have a cat, too, always like right, putting his butt right in the camera. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So I can do the demo now if you want. Oh, I think yeah. it will be a good time. Uh, yeah. So and I just wanted to say I thought it was awesome that like you created this project just because you wanted to learn about security. Like, I feel like. That's, that's definitely the best approach to go, like do it so you can learn about it. And I love that, that you took that approach. Yeah, I mean, pe different people work in different ways, you know, and they, they learn better in different ways. Some mm -hmm. people, you know, might learn well by reading books, other people by, you know, watching YouTube videos or reading documents. I learn best by doing, I've got to hack stuff. Um, yeah. That's absolutely key for me. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Let's go, let's do it. It looks like people are excited about the demo. They're like, let's get into it. <laughs> okay, cool. Let me just. Uh... Many people say hi from the audience. So hi, Ron. Yeah. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> okay. So let's share my screen. Yeah, another comment here comes the lightning strike, which I guess is about the logo of uh, of Zap. Yeah. So can you see my screen now? 
Yes, yes we, we can. can. Great. Um, so yeah, as I was saying before, um, so Zap starts off as a desktop tool. We know most people actually use it in automation now. Um, so you can run it from the command line, you can run it in API and um, daemon mode. Um, but what I'll do is I will um, just show you, you can launch your browser pointing at your target application, uh, which I can make a bit bigger. And you can just navigate around your application and you can kind of um, do whatever you normally do. And what you'll see is all the requests and responses are proxied through Zap. And you can actually see the request and the response. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other things you'll see down here is we've got a load of alerts. And these are, this is Zap telling you stuff. So we've actually got some, um, you know, Zap is actually telling us that there are problems without doing anything particular. Because Zap doesn't do things unless you tell it to. Uh, but one of the things it can do is passively um, analyzing the question responses. And it can go here and it can see this particular response. It can see there's a form and there's no anti cross site request forgery token. It can tell that. Um, so it's already ra raised an alert. So, and it's raised four alerts, in fact. So we can tell that there are problems without Zap attacking the application. So you know, some people you can use Zap on production applications if you you know don't actually do attacking, and it'll still tell you useful things. We can see that you know there's uh, the cross uh, the content security policy header is not set. We can see there's cross domain configuration. We can see there's cookies set with no HTTP only flags. So there's lots of things it's already telling us. Um, but there's lots more Zap can do. So one thing we can do, we can do, we can run the spider. So we, there's different ways of exploring an application. Obviously, it's great if you can do it manually. Um, that's most applications are, you know, they're designed for humans to use. Um, so usually humans are quite good at exploring them. But that takes time and um, it's much harder to automate. We have spiders, um, and what you can do is if you right click. You'll see loads of different options. We have a traditional spider that just crawls the application. We have an Ajax spider which launches browsers and clicks on things. Um, but we've also got things like active scanning when we're actually attacking the website. So we can do all these things, and Zap will tell you a whole load of different types of vulnerabilities. Um, so, and you can do fun things as well. So you see here we've got this very simple control. And I, there's a limit to what I can put in because it's controlled here and we can't actually go above 12 and we can't go below um, zero. But if we actually, we can put a breakpoint on, we can submit that and we can actually see the request here and we can change it. So we can change it, make it much bigger and we can submit that. And then you'll see we've added a lot more than um, the 12 we're allowed or we can actually go in and we can submit it and we can change it to minus a large amount and then we will see that the shop actually owes us money so we can do all sorts of fun things um, zap shows you what's going on underneath the covers you can see all the requests and responses you can manipulate them you can replay them and zap will then attack things in the background as well if you want so Zap is a very powerful tool. Uh, but what we can also do, we, can, we have um, this automation framework. So you can actually create an automation plan based on all the things that Zap does, um, based on what you've, how you've set that up, Zap up. And then you can run the jobs in the, in the desktop. And then once you're happy with them, you can export them and you can run them from the command line. Um, and then you can run them um, um, from your command line, or you can run them in CI, CD, or whatever. So that was a very quick demo. How was that? That was great. <laughs> I yeah, learned a lot about security <laughs> so far. Thank you, Simon. Um, I, I have a question for you. So you sure. mentioned before also the growing uh, evolution of uh, web applications through the years. And since Zab is here for the past like 12 years now, um, how did Zab evolve over the years? And how do you plan to keep, uh, keep evolving so that Ooh. it catches up with modern web apps. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing that, you know, we've seen huge changes in the last 12 years. Uh, and I mean, I think one thing is Zapper's, 
has changed quite a lot over the years as well. So I think it was in 2012, we introduced the Ajax Spider. So what we found was the traditional spider, it did the standard crawling, it just, you know, looked at request responses, found URLs and did the standard crawling. This doesn't work with modern web apps. If you look at the, the source code um, you do, in your browser, right click view source, you'll see a load of libraries and nothing else. You have to actually look at the DOM. You have, so you have to have a real browser there. So the Ajax spider works by launching browsers and clicks on things. It's much slower than the traditional spider, but it's what you've got to do. So the Ajax spider, 2012, um, one of the first security project uh, products to support that. Um, Web sockets in the same year, and we were pretty much the first um, um, security tools to support Web sockets, and probably have the best Web socket support mm -hmm. still to this day. Um, API scanning, we started with SOAP in 2014, mm -hmm. Open API Swagger. 2017, we supported GraphQL in 2020, and then things like out-of-band testing last year. Uh, but we still know that modern web apps are still a bit challenging. They are yeah. hard. Um, so that is a focus for me, myself, um, and I'm working on something right now. I've got some fun things to show, um, but it's not quite ready yet. So um, it's going to be releasing something soon, and it won't solve everything, but it's a, it's a, it's a start, and it's something, again, we want people to get involved in. Um, so it's something we're definitely focusing on um, and watch this space or even better get in touch and get involved. Nice. I, I love that. I actually have two questions, one from the audience and one from myself. One, I think this question is really fun. They asked any future plans to add dark mode. <laughs> We've got it. It's already there. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I'm going to have to show you this now. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> let's just go to... Um, so share my screen again, because even better, um, we have this little control up here, sw dynam dynamically switch the look and feel, and there we go. Simon, can you share your screen? Yeah, you're oh, not sharing. <laughs> oh no, Sorry. I haven't finished. Right, okay, so wait a minute, that means I've got to undo what I did because it loses the effect. Yeah, sorry, the dialogue came up to share, but it didn't, I didn't finish. I love can how the audience knows that tool so well. Uh, I know. <laughs> how's that? Can you see it now? Yep. Yes. Cool. So you see the little icon here, dynamically switch the look and feel. You've got a load of look and feels, one of which wow. is flat dock. And there you go. Oh, nice. So we can now, um, so how does that? In dock mode. Looks good. Yeah, that looks great. I love how over time y'all have, um, adapted and continue to stay relevant like you're supporting things like graphql and you have dark mode <laughs> um i think both that, things yeah <laughs> that is um and then my question is um my other question is just like what would you say is the most common mistake you've been seeing um re in regards to security and web development today it could be like within zap or Outside of it. Uh, yeah, that's tricky. Um, so, and the phone's going in the background. Great. Uh, that's well, okay. I mean, one, one thing is, I think, um, I mean, we don't get a lot of direct feedback. People use that, they don't tell us much about it. Um, and we do know that um, we do get some telemetry. So, I had a look at that. I mean, I know that we have, there's lots of OWAS projects, one of the OWAS top 10, which is very famous. And the top one there is broken access control. Mm -hmm. um, if they say it's the top one, I'll believe them. But that's something that's typically harder to detect by tools like Zap. We do have an access control um, add-on, um, but I don't think it's used a lot. And you, you need to do quite a bit of configuration for it. But I had a look at the telemetry, and the most significant vulnerabilities I think we find are still injection vulnerabilities. Okay. And to my surprise, the most, um, the most one we find now is DOM XSS. Um, I was expecting uh, traditional XSS or, or, SQL, inje or, or um, yeah, SQL injection to be up there. It's actually DOM XSS. And last month, we found uh, nearly half a million DOM XSS vulnerabilities. Now, how many of those were in deliberately vulnerable applications? I don't know. Um, but, you know, we just have telemetry gives us basic stats. Um, it doesn't tell us what those stats really mean. But, yeah, of the injection vulnerabilities, DOM XSS is now top. As far as we can tell, which is uh, which is interesting, but the other one I think things like logical errors. Um, I think and I think oh, also the top ten calls them insecure design, and this mm -hmm. is the these are the ones that 
It's things like the the budget one where you were, you could put a negative amount in. They're difficult to automate tools to find them because you have to some have to some have some understanding of the application. And these are the, these are one of the reasons why we're not going to get rid of pen testers. Um, mm -hmm. You know. You can run all the automated tools you like, but they will find certain types of vulnerabilities well. And there's certain types of vulnerable, you know, vulnerabilities where you have to understand the application. Um, that's where the, the human mind comes into its own. Um, and that's where the pen tests are so important. Um, so, you know, I, I think those ones are, those are the fun ones, really. You mm -hmm. know, when, you, when you're looking at, how can I understand this application? How can I get under its skin? How can I abuse its functionality? You know, those are those are the things you need to that you, you can get stuck into as a pen tester. I love how our audience absolutely loves uh, Zap. For example, there are some other comment about one more thing I like about Zap. It's docs based on the comment. So that, that's another really good piece of feedback for Simon today. Uh, I think Simon, based on what you said, my next question based on the high number of DOM uh, attacks you mentioned is, how can, if you could, what you can do to make uh, security a higher priority for developers? Right, uh, I mean, one thing is awareness. Um, you know, it's, so it's, a, it's up to us security professionals to keep press, you know, explaining how important it is. Um, I think it's, you know, if you're talking commercial environments, it's a management problem, it really is. Um, because developers do, yeah, we do what we're told. You know, if management is saying get this stuff done as quickly as possible, then that's what will happen. If you've just got, if you've got functionality, you know, functionality is more important than security. Yeah. If you don't, you know, if it doesn't do, if the application doesn't do anything, it's useless. You know, it yeah. really is. So, you know, all this thing is security is the most important thing. I don't agree. You know, functionality has to come first, um, but we need the functionality to be secure. Um, and for that, we need to have time. As developers, we need to have time to make sure that, you know, the applications are secure, they're maintainable, um, all these important things, they scale. Um, so management have to understand that to do, to do software properly takes longer, um, but it means it's, it's, you know, better in the end, you don't have to go back and actually um, fix things, you know, fix all the problems, um, all the vulnerabilities, uh, all the bugs later on. So yeah have more time in upfront doing things um, like security uh, but you know it's you've got to get the you've got to get things working first I love that you pointed that out because in all my my few years working as a developer I hear people saying like it's very important to do testing it's very important to do security but I'm like I don't have time like we have this short little sprint for me to do a whole bunch and then when I'm like, oh, I'm still like adding some tests, they're like, hurry this up. So I love that you pointed that out. It's it's coming from the the top down. It has to, in organizations, you know, it, it's developers. You, you can't say, uh, I know you told me it's got to be ready, and you say, you know, this is what I'm being measured on, but I'm going to take another few weeks to do. Does doesn't work that way. It does not at all. Um, also, Simon. If somebody from the audience asks where they can learn about security or become more aware from it, are there like any resources that you can recommend? Uh, OWASP, OWASP.org. There's a huge amount of resources. Everything free is free. Everything's open source. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you're a developer and you like getting stuck in, then well, contribute to Zap or contribute to one of the other OWASP projects. I mean, OWASP is a bit of a different organization in that. Anyone can join. It's not a one where you, your organization's got to pay to get involved. So individuals can get involved like I did. Uh, and you can get involved in any project you like. Just approach a project leader, go, go onto Slack or Discord or wherever you find them, raise an issue or something, and say, hi, I'd like to get involved. If you do that with Zap, we're like, yeah, come in, come in. You know, there's loads of things to do. And it's not just programming. You know, there's, there's so much more to open source than just programming. So, you know, there's testing, there's documentation. Um, there's support, there's loads of things you can get involved with. Um, or you can learn programming. Um, one of the, the Zap core team, uh, Rick was a security guy, and he learned programming by programming on Zap. So, you know, there's loads of things you can do. But if you want to yeah, learn by doing, then loads of OS projects, you know, just pick the one that appeals to you most. Hopefully Zap, but otherwise go for what you want. That's awesome that he learned it through, like learned programming through Zap. That's amazing um, what, 
your project is enabling and empowering. Um, I'm going to ask a question that we started to talk about before we went live. And it was like about the name SAP. Like you yeah. told us it was a backronym. That's the first time I ever heard of a backronym. So yeah, tell us more about how you came up with the name and um, and us learning about the fact that it stands for um, Z attack proxy. I hope I got that right. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So I, naming is hard. It's really hard. I, I'm no good at coming up with names. Um, so I, I, I forked this old project called Paros, and I wanted to give it a very different name um, because I actually wanted to be the security tool for developers. And that was our tagline to start with. We only removed that after too many security people complained. So I wanted a different name, but what to call it. Now, I'm a developer. I've always written scripts. You know, if you want to automate, if you've got to do something once, you do it once. If, it, if you've got to do it two or three times, I'm going to write a script to do it. You know, that's what I do. If I think the script is going to be useful in the future, I give it a meaningful name, put it in my bin folder, then I'll be able to find it again and use it. But loads of times I write one-off scripts. Um, I would always call them Zap or Pow. Quick names, quick on the keyboard, Zap, Pow, get it done. Kind of thinking of the um, um, cartoons as well, Zap, Pow, you know, like that. So I was trying to think of names, and those two kind of kept on coming back. And Zap kind of like, well, you can zap a website, you know, it's kind of, I liked that, you know, attacking type thing. So that seemed to make sense. But because it came from this cartoon thing, I wanted to be capitals. So for it to be capitals, the easiest way is to make an acronym, it's an acronym. So it stands for something, but obviously I've got the thing first. So we call them backronyms where you, you find, you know, you come up with the term first and you find, work out what it stands for afterwards. So zap, P for proxy, nice and easy. A for attack didn't take me too long, I must admit. Um, Z, what can Z stand for? I couldn't think of anything. However, so I thought Z can stand for Z, but I didn't want Americans calling it Z. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound right. Z attack proxy, no. Sorry <laughs> to Americans, but no. So Z stands for Z, Z E D. And it kind of ties in a bit with Led Zeppelin as well, because they called Led Zeppelin, nice. it was originally L E A D, they changed it to L E D. So mm -hmm. it would be led rather than lead Zeppelin. It was kind of a bit of play, you know, that reminded me of that as well. So, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, uh, not liking the American pronunciation, a bit of Led Zeppelin in there, those kind of things. So that's where Zed Attack Proxy came from. Is, is like the founder it. then from the logo of uh, Led Zeppelin? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, the, 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 uh, originally the logo I was wondering about having like a ray gun or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just went to the community and said, uh, you know, what should it be? Can anyone, you know, we're not particularly artistic in the core team, come up with a logo. And someone came up with the, the lightning bolt logo and yeah, that works. So, uh, so that's what we've stuck with really. But, uh... I love the comments too. Like someone had um, already predicted that he was like, maybe, or they, I'm not sure. They were like, oh, possibly this is from a cartoon. And you literally said that right afterwards. <laughs> Thanks for yep. the background. Um, no problem. I, oh, it looks like, it looks like Joseph had a question, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Simon, it's important to mention to the audience that hacking should be done in a responsible way and avoid <laughs> using Zap for people they don't have the written consent of doing so. So please, can you explain this? Absolutely. So, I mean, the thing is, what we're trying to do is, and the whole reason for Zap is to make things more secure. We're the good people, you know, we're not the bad guys. Um, and so it's very important to only attack things you have permission to attack. Now, the easiest way to do that is to actually attack your own services, your own. Uh, so something like budget, I'm, I'm running on my MacBook right now. And there are actually loads of, you know, either if you're writing something yourself, web application, great, attack that. Uh, if you're in an organization, get permission from your security team before running on staging or anything like that. Um, but if you're, if you're learning about security and you haven't done these services, then there are loads of deliberately vulnerable web applications out there. And in fact, there's an OWASP project, and I'm one of the co-leads on it, where we try and track them all. So deliberately vulnerable web applications, uh, no, uh, vulnerable web applications directory, VWAD, um, OWASP VWAD, have search for it, and there's loads of deliberately vulnerable applications. Some of them are online, um, things like Google Firing Range, but a lot of them you can download and run them locally. So do that, and that's a great way to learn. Awesome. 
All right, so we want to know if we can get a little sneak peek or you can talk a little bit about what you're currently working on. Um, you did mention that you're building something on ZAP right now. Is it possible if you could tell us? <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, Just right. a little bit. okay, so I've not told, this is, this is not public knowledge. Um, so, you know, of the rest of the team, now I'm working on it. Um, but one of the problems with modern web applications is so much is actually running in the browser. And what we, we've got something called a heads up display, um, which brings that into the browser. But the way that works, it injects content into the web application. It's, it does some horrible things. Um, it works, but it, it's nasty. Um, but what we want to make sure is we have, we need to have more presence in the browser and work out what's going on. So I'm actually working on a Zap um, browser extension. And this will run in both Chrome and Firefox. And one of the reasons we can do it now is when we launch, when we launch browsers from within Zap, we can um, include browser extensions. So that's what we'll do. Um, I mean, it'll be optional initially. Um, it'll be quite a while before we do it automatically, other thought. Uh, but if you um, download the new um, add-on, which isn't available yet, but hopefully relatively soon, then there'll be a, a Zap browser extension. So, it's a, so Zap's presence in the browser. And that means we can do a lot of things. We can um, passively monitor the DOM. Um, and we can, what we're trying to do is find out more information in the browser and stream that back to Zap and display it there. Um, there's loads more things we can do. Um, it, so it's going to be a slow start, um, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. And there's a lot of potential here and loads of things. And a lot of this is actually um, browser based, like the HUD is. So Zap is. The, the Zap um, desktop and uh, service is written in Java, which you know it, less people know these days. Um, whereas the browser extension is actually written in TypeScript, um, and that's this is the first time I've written TypeScript. Um, I've, I've written quite a lot of JavaScript before, but I wouldn't claim I'm a front-end developer. But I'm really getting to TypeScript. You know, the, the fact the compiler tells me stuff is wrong is that's what I want. You know, I'm used to yeah. this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> So if you're into uh, either JavaScript or TypeScript and want to get involved in Zap that have been put off before because you thought it's all Java, it's not. Um, get involved, you know, get in touch, and there's loads of fun things we can work on. That actually leads me to another question on, like, how would you suggest people contribute to, to Zap? Okay, so Zap is a big project. We've got some like 45 different repos or something crazy. Uh, you know, so um, we're not we're a small team. Um, there's only four of us in the core team. Uh, hundreds of people contributed, but what we have is there's loads of different ways to contribute, and we have a page on zaproxy.org. Um, you'll be able to find it. Uh, go to the menu. I think there's even a contribute uh, menu. Uh, so there's a whole different section of pages, and it's all things like I mean, just liking the the repos. Um, following ZA Proxy on Twitter, you know, simple things like that you can do. Uh, you can help with documentation. You can help with testing Zap. You know, there's all these vulnerable web apps out there. I would love to run Zap against them. Um, we, we're running Zap against a whole set of websites every night, and we publish the results. They're available on ZAProxy.org. Um, but there's loads more, you know, there's about half a dozen we're doing at the moment, and there are hundreds of deliberately vulnerable web apps. We'd like to publish how Zap does against all of them. Um, you won't get commercial tools doing this. We're open source. We can do it. So, you know, we would love to have, get people running um, Zap against things. Um, and we had a, a girl on um, the OWASP uh, uh, Slack today saying, you know, I tried Zap against this, and it didn't find this DOM XSS vulnerability. I think you should be using this attack. It's like, great. This is what we want to hear. By the way, where you found the source code, that's where it is. Would you like to help? So I'll give it a go. Great, you know, this is what we want. We want people to get involved. Um, so if it's just telling us, you know, stuff Zap doesn't find false negatives, stuff Zap says is vulnerable false positives, we want to know those. We want to make Zap better. There's loads of ways you can help. Uh, just go onto the website, have a look, zaproxy.org, um, and there's pages and pages of ways you how you can contribute. I love that you brought that up. I think it's often undervalued or underrated that a contribution can just be testing the product like open source maintainers want to know if their product works well for you so i love that yeah the community is our qa department you know we do not have a qa department apart from the community so we rely uh on the feedback we get so yeah we we want to hear about these things 
Thanks so much for this um, inspiration, Simon, because uh, you encourage people to contribute to open source, to come to Zap. Uh, that's amazing. Um, I think my final question that is more like for the audience that is having a security background, it's about the noise. Um, my understanding is that if you perform everything in an automatic way in Zap, then you have more noise compared to manual. Is this correct? Well, I mean, that, that's one problem about Zap. Um, it's too popular in a way. It's used by people who are completely new to um, security, right up to the hardcore pen testers. It's used by people on the desktops. It's used by companies, um, you know, that automating Zap against thousands of websites. How do we get Zap to be the best it can for all these different use cases? It's impossible. Um, so we try and get it, um, you know, what we think is best. Uh, but in the end, you need to tune Zap. So Zap is insanely tunable, um, much more so than most commercial tools. So things like um, the, the rules, you can say exactly which rules Zap runs. Mm -hmm. And you can also, so we've got the release quality rules, we have beta quality rules, we have alpha quality rules, and every rule has um, thresholds. So thresholds can be the average, what we think is right. We have a low threshold, which means Zap reports more things, more mm -hmm. chance of false positives. We have a high threshold, where Zap will report less things, but there's more, you know, less chance of um, false positives, but more chance of false negatives. Mm -hmm. Then for the attack rules, we have strengths. So we have a low strength where Zap will do fewer attacks. So it'll be mm -hmm. quicker, um, but you'll miss things. We have kind of medium then high. Um, and we have an insane strength as well, which we don't run in, recommend running in, in automation because you know, that's where you just pick on one particular parameter on one page and just go crazy on that maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so Zap is really configurable and it's good to learn about Zap and learn how to configure it. And one thing is Zap knows nothing about your application until it starts interacting exactly. with it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of configuration things like if, you, if you're doing a black box testing, then you don't know anything about it either. But if you, if you say you're, you're the developer, you know that your application is using MySQL and is not using mm -hmm. Oracle or SQL Server. So you can tell Zap via the technology tab um, that it's using MySQL and it's not using Oracle or any other database. Mm -hmm. That means Zap will only do the MySQL attacks and it won't do the others, so it'll be quicker and less chance of false positives for those. So there's a lot of things, you know, we try and make Zap as good as we can out of the box. But if you know about your application, you can tune Zap to handle it so much better. Um, and that's key. And so, you know, if, you, if you're a developer, that's very straightforward. Um, if you're testing using Zap on hundreds of applications, it's harder. Um, we would love to, I mean, I've always wanted to be able to kind of get Zap to configure itself. Uh -huh. um, this is hard because we don't, get feedback. we don't get the feedback about these things, um, you know, so it's very hard for us. But one thing I put in recently, is, so I'd say we've got these two spiders. We've got the traditional spider, which is fast and furious, but doesn't handle mm -hmm. modern web apps. Then we have the Ajax spider, which handles modern web apps, but is much slower. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're testing a lot of applications, how do you know which to use? So what we have in the automation framework is the Ajax spider has an option. Um, what you do, you run the standard spider, then you wait for the passive scan to finish. Mm -hmm. uh, so the passive scan is going on in the background. We've got multiple threads now, so it's a bit quicker. But one of the passive scan rules tries to detect whether it's a modern web application. If it is, it doesn't. It's not a vulnerability. It raises an info. But that means when the Ajax spider comes along, it looks for that alert. So it goes, okay, it's it's a modern web application. I need to run. If it's not a mod, if there's no, um, if it, if that alert hasn't been raised. One of the things it checks is to see whether that, alert, that um, rule is actually installed. If it's not installed and not enabled, then it won't run anyway. The HX spider has got to run. But if it knows that it was installed and could have run and didn't, then it's an old, uh, it's a traditional app. We don't need to run the HX spider. So that speeds things up. So there's all those kind of things we can do, or that kind of thing, and loads more to try and detect um, different frameworks. But uh, yeah, we need. We need more feedback from the community. You know, we don't have this huge number of real-world applications to test. Um, so, yeah, we need feedback from people, from both individuals and companies. That's so awesome. All right, I have like a, like a couple questions, I guess, from the audience, and then 
um, we'll pivot into the non-technical questions. And actually, it looks like Fall, I just want to shout out Fall and Valkyrie, because um, they seem to know a lot about Zap. I don't know if they're like a core contributor or they just use it heavily, um, but they, they commented that Zap is apparently so big that not even hardcore pen testers use all of the automated add-ons. And someone asked, like, if Zap is developed in Java and some parts are written in JavaScript, how can they contribute if they only code in Python or Go? Um, yeah. So we actually have APIs. Um, so Zap um, has its own API, and I believe it's you know, it's inc I mean it's not everything. There's some fuzzing stuff we can't do, but it's probably a more complete API than pretty much any commercial tool out there. Um, but we also generate clients. So we have a um, Python client and a Go client, and they probably could do with being a lot better. Um, and on the Python side, we do we actually have package scans which are written in Python. And a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the tooling is written in Python as well um, for our build servers and stuff. So there's definitely things um, that could help with on both of those, particularly in the API side. Um, but the other thing is, it's actually fun learning new languages. Um, so, you know, I see myself as a Java developer, but I, you know, I write JavaScript, I'm learning TypeScript. Um, I've written some Go, I use Python quite a lot. I wouldn't restrict yourself to one language as a developer. And to tie into the other thing about um, professional pen testers, a lot of professional pen testers, as I said before, they know Burp. That's right. But you shouldn't tie yourself to one tool. You should yeah. learn all the top tools out there. And I think Zap has proved itself as a top tool. So, you know, you shouldn't restrict yourself to one tool. You shouldn't restrict yourself to one, you know, as a, a pen tester, you shouldn't just use one tool for one thing. As a developer, you shouldn't learn, you just use one language. You learn so much more from different languages. Yeah, I, JavaScript is weird, but I've learned a lot from it. Um, I wouldn't like to write a big complex application with it. TypeScript, maybe, you know. So um, I had to play around with Rust, God, that's hard. Um, but, you know, it's these are fun things to do. You should learn and grow and play with different tools and techniques and languages. I agree with you. I think um, open source is a perfect space for you to experiment with a new tool or, or language. Um, and then another, oh, Joseph, you're going to say something? Oh, sorry. I, I keep looking at when you unmute. So I'm like, oh, he's saying something. Cool. <laughs> um, another question that was in the comment section and Fallen Valkyrie answered as well, but I would love to hear your, your answer. They said what parts are written in, with JS um, and Fallen Valkyrie said some parts of the HUD. Yeah. So the HUD, the heads up display, um, that everything that runs in the browser is written in JavaScript and then it makes API calls back to Zap where it's written in um, Java. So, but all of the HUD side is JavaScript and this new browser extension I'm writing in, uh, writing um, that is TypeScript, again, with Java backend stuff in, um, but yeah, so that those are the two projects that uh, uh, use JavaScript and TypeScript. Thank you. And um, my other question to you is, will you all be participating in Hacktoberfest? You don't have to be, it's just been on my mind since Hacktoberfest uh, is in a few days. <laughs> And there is a Zap blog post, which I think is um, aimed to go uh, live tomorrow. Um, so we, I've actually just, we've just written a blog post for, uh, there's so much happening in Zap, which I don't think people are aware of. So we now do monthly blog posts at the end of each That's month. Awesome. So there's one for September, um, and we released an insane number of add-ons. Um, forgotten how many now, but it's just crazy numbers. There's loads of stuff going on in there. So that's in that blog today. And tomorrow there's gonna to be hopefully another blog post on Zaps um, getting involved in Hacktober uh, because that's just another way. You know, all of these things we, we think are great. Um, we wanna get involved in. That's awesome. And for anyone listening in who doesn't know what Hacktoberfest is, it's an annual event in October where everyone um, does a little bit of a focus on contributing to open source. So if you've never contributed before, this might be a perfect time for you because a lot of times maintainers label issues good first issues, um, which are like issues that are good for newcomers to work on. Um, cool. We are done with all like the technical questions here. I'm going to pivot into my my traditional non-technical questions that I always <laughs> ask. And the first one is like, what's your favorite food? And actually, Joseph, I'm curious for you too. Sorry to put you on the spot, but what's your favorite okay, food? Okay, that's good. <laughs> I wanted to come go first. You are the guest here. <laughs> I like okay, food. <laughs> I, I, 
it's really difficult, you know, good food, just generally good food. Um, I mean, a really good steak, you know, uh, if, if I'm in a, it's got a modern British restaurant, I'll probably go for a steak or something like that. But, uh, but I, like, I like good food, definitely. It's one of life's pleasures. So. It is. <laughs> It is. What about you? I would say I'm more into like uh, Mediterranean cuisine, uh, yeah. but lately, maybe like over the past year, I what I enjoy the most is uh, sushi, so Japanese cuisine, sushi. and specifically uh, maybe like seared salmon nigiris. Rizel? Oh, now I have to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't expect it. Um, let me see. I, I like this um, Japanese food called, well, I, okay trying to reel, reel back but basically I like roti and I know they have like Indian style roti I like that too but I like um Guyanese style roti which is where my parents are from um in South America so it's like nice. a Caribbean addition to it is it, is um, it spicy yeah it's like it has curry and stuff like that uh -huh. it's spicy <laughs> or well you can add spicy things to it actually um but yeah <laughs> um Cool. And then my next question is like, what's your favorite Beyonce song? And if you don't have one, what is your favorite song to both of you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a, an old school headbanger, I'm afraid. Um, so heavy metal. Uh, favorite one? I don't know. I've got something like uh, Motorhead Killed by Death. Something like, you know, good traditional heavy metal. Nice. <laughs> What about you, Joseph? I, I have to say that I caught myself like listening to Beyonce because that you know some like gym playlists may have a few songs here and there. So what comes like straight into my mind is um, Sweet Dreams or a Beautiful oh, Nightmare. I like um, that. <laughs> I, I love that you decided to sing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good song. That, I think that's like an album that's on an album that not many people enjoyed as much, but that was like one of my favorite albums. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Is that your favorite you. Beyonce song then? Or I... what's your favorite Beyonce song? <sighs> There's so many. Like I like her Destiny's Child era will like pay my mm -hmm. bills and stuff like that. And then um I do like that album with Halo, Sweet Dreams, and yeah. then there's every album I like a favorite song, so we could go on forever. <laughs> um, but thanks y'all, thanks to y'all so so much. I want to give Simon a moment to like if he has any last words or anything that he wants to plug, like go follow him on Twitter or something. I don't know <laughs> what do you, what do you want to leave the stream with. All I want to say is if you want to get involved, if you want to contribute to Zap, just get in touch. You know, Zap is a community project. We want people to get involved. And it doesn't matter what level you're at. There's always something you can do. So please get in touch. Awesome. I really enjoyed speaking with you and learning about like the origins of Zap, like why you created it to just learn about security and what you've enabled for other people to get a chance to also learn about security, to keep their websites protected and to um, even get a chance to learn to program. Um, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to, to say, Joseph, but I want to give you a chance to speak. I just wanted to say that uh, I really enjoyed the session today because Simon addressed pressing questions coming straight from the developer audience, like questions that every developer has about Dust, SAS, um, how they can benefit from, from Zap, what the features are on, and how it's evolving to what is today. So it's a, it's a huge thanks uh, to Simon from my side as well. And I just want to tell the audience that we are preparing another security guest this uh, January with uh, Nancy from my team. And uh, I, I don't want to spoil who the project is. But let's say for now that it's another big open source security project. Simon will always be the first guest we had for a security themed Open Source Friday. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for being engaged and interacting with us. Bye, y'all.